Jennifer Alemani. Great conversation with Jennifer. She finished her memoir, her first. She had some tragedy in her life, passing of, of boyfriend and mother earlier on, and journaled all her life as a child and moved away from it, not dealing with her emotions. And then after her boyfriend had passed, she, uh, you know, months later, she went back to it. And before you know it, she just felt herself being channeled and had this memoir just kind of pour out of her, as she describes. A great conversation about, you know, we all have a book inside of us. We all have a story. Are you journaling? Are you meditating? Uh, some great tips and advice on how to do that and uh, what her process is and what she's doing now. Uh, but just a really great conversation with a fascinated woman um, from Brooklyn, uh, now in, in Manhattan. But I really enjoyed my conversation with Jennifer, uh, and I know you're going to enjoy it as well. Um, I'll just give one little teaser. And uh, Fleetwood Mac, thanks for listening. Hi. I'm Joey Pins. People ask me, how did I lose 130 pounds? The quick answer is always discipline. I started my business, wasn't paying attention to my health, was eating too much, you know, drinking too much sweets. My daughter was born. Next thing I know, I'm pre-diabetic, I have hypertension. I knew something had to change. Discipline. I, like many of you, have faced many challenges in your career, in your family, in your life, in your faith. How did you attack them? How did you approach them? How did you solve them, hopefully? It all had to have some degree of discipline. I'm also asked, how did you found and start a tech business that lasted over 25 years? Discipline. I was committed to it, enjoyed technology, didn't enjoy some aspects of it, but knew it was necessary. Discipline. Our podcast mission, how do we use discipline to better ourselves and society? Join me, please, as I talk to interesting people and discuss how they use discipline in their family, in their passion, in their careers, and how it helped them. Our podcast vision, growth through learning from others. Joey Pins Discipline Conversations. It will be light and serious. Join us, please. Thank you for consideration. Hello, Jennifer. Great, great to meet you. I really appreciate your time. I uh, really enjoyed learning about you. Um, how important is journaling? Oh, gosh, it's everything. Mm. I, I think it, I, I wouldn't be in the place I am right now if I hadn't been doing that since I was a teenager, to be honest. You started yeah. journaling when you were a teenager. And, mm -hmm. and what led you there? Why? Oh, gosh, I really don't know. I just felt... I felt called to it. I, I bought a journal one day and I just started writing and then it just became a habit for me. And then I always felt good doing it. So then I just continued. And the process of seeing your own thoughts in your words as you're writing them, seeing them and visualizing them, is that cathartic? How do, Does that help? Yes. Yeah, I want to say it's cathartic because I realize if, you know, I, I don't look back at my old journals often. I don't really have a lot of them anymore. Mm. Um, but when I would look back, I would see the words I was using and I would kind of, kind of go into like, oh, wow, look, I was really, whether I was down or whether I was really in a good place, I realized by my language I was using in, in the words I was writing. Very interesting. So it helped me, I want to say, yeah, cathartic and deal with things because I realized maybe I wasn't dealing with certain things at times because of So it. like 10, 11, high school, how, what, what age? Uh, high, high school. So I want to say probably 15 I want to say probably 15 years old. And were were you happy and started doing it or some bad things happening or was it a mixture of both? Did you kind of resort to it? I think I, I wouldn't say it was bad things. It, it was just life was happening mm. around me. And I was always the one, I was always the child to always like look at life around me and think about it. So then I just started writing things in a sense, if that makes sense. It wasn't necessarily something bad. It was just me getting my thoughts out because I was realizing certain things of life at the time, I want to say. And like after school or during school, you'd say, I can't wait to get home and journal about this. Or I'm going, I'm on the subway back. You were thinking, I can't wait to journal about this. Would that happen? Yeah, I would. Yeah. I would make a mental note. I have a very good memory. It's always been very strange. My memory, very strong. So I, all I would need was like one key word to remember what was going on. So I would kind of make a mental note of one word 
and, and that would bring back a lot of what I needed to write about. So I would just re- almost tell myself, remember that word. So then you can go into what you wanted to write. And are you, are you first person in these? Are you always narrating or are you creating dialogue? No, nope, not creating dialogue. It's just me, how I'm feeling. Like basically with just raw emotions, completely raw. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't, you know, I, I just put it out there. I always just put out exactly how I was feeling. If I was feeling really, really down and crying, I would really document it. Um, so it was just very just detailed in first person. And you describe the events that brought you to those emotions. Yeah. Yeah. Or things that happened or people around me, maybe actions of theirs that brought me to whatever I was feeling. Um, yeah. And, some... and never in your mind did you think I want somebody else to read this. This was only for you. Yeah, it was only for me. Um, at times, I not all of them, but at times, I I burned a journal or two wow. in my life because I just needed to get it out, and that was also very cathartic. Where, you know, because obviously all of them were certain periods of my time in my life. So I think when it came to that, I if I read them back and I knew I was done with that segment of my life or whatever went on, I burned the whole the whole wow. journal. So it's a uh, describe yeah. that scene. You, 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 are you outside? <laughs> are you, is it in a fireplace? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm outside. I was outside generally. I, I've always lived in an apartment when I was in Brooklyn, so it wasn't, uh, I wouldn't have a fireplace inside to be doing that. So it was outside. In a park <laughs> and you just get a match and you, yeah. you just, are you alone? Yeah. I was alone. Yeah, always alone. It was always, yeah. Because yeah. the journaling was alone. So that nice. was, it was, you know, a private thing for me. And so. you'd watch every ember just kind of crawl, just crumble. Yes. Yes. And with that, you were just removing those emotions and saying goodbye to that as well. Yep. And then just letting it go to the wind, basically. Yeah. See, I never did this. So I had just, I'm fascinated by this. And you, you never considered yourself a yeah. writer. No, no. I had teachers in school who had mentioned to my mother in high school, oh, she, she may be gifted, you know, maybe, maybe a gifted writer. She really, my papers were, I did well. I, I didn't do well grade wise, but yet my papers were always in depth. Um, but you know, coming from a Latin background, humble means, you know, it wasn't something that was encouraged, you know, it was more of get a steady, you know, kind of blue collar job situation and and so on. And, you know, I never really thought of it myself too. I really didn't think in a sense of, I want to be a writer and classifying myself as that. I just knew I liked to write, if that made sense. It was just words coming out of me. And yeah, I always envied those students that were good writers because if it's, you know, if it's none of the sciences where it's an, always one answer, if it's some of the arts or some of the other subjects, philosophy, et cetera, where, you know, you can kind of get arrived to your answer in a different way. And there's many different answers, you know, answers. You can always get there. And writers always, I felt, had the advantage. You know, I, I remember thinking of uh, Faulkner has a great quote where he says, don't be a writer, just be writing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's funny to see that you said that because I used to think the opposite, mm-hmm. right? I thought those that had the good grades and the logics of science and biology, so on and so forth, math, right? That those were the ones who had the mm-hmm. upper hand than, than someone like me. And it's interesting because I remember at one point in college, I had, um, we had to do a, a, it was a psychology English kind of class. And we had to do this comparative um, and pulled two characters from these two pieces that we were reading. So it was Les Miserables and then Madame Bovary, mm-hmm. right? So I pulled out these two characters and then did a psychological analysis of these two women and their and, and everything about them. And the teacher called me, or the professor called me on a Saturday in my dorm room. And right away, I, I, I was the kid that always thought like something's wrong. Like they think they, I, they think I did something, you know? And I remember thinking like, oh no, oh no. Like she thinks I, I forged the paper or something, whatever. Of course it wasn't that. She was like, wow. She says at 20 years old, she goes, I'm blown away by what you're writing here in this analysis. Wow. And yeah, it was what it was, you know? And then you become an au pair and then you go into HR for, for 20 plus years, correct? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I became a nanny right out of college. Um, I, I, w- I went to college initially to be an early childhood education teacher. I wanted to be a kindergarten teacher specifically. Um, at the time, I remember they were changing a lot of the education guidelines, making kindergarten a little bit more intense. And I didn't believe in that. I thought that at that point, up until age five, six, you know, children learn through play. And that was the major thing. And I knew that in my, in my gut, in my core. And I didn't like it. So I kind of just said, how do I pivot away from this? But then what do I do? 
And then someone suggested, oh, what about being a nanny, a living nanny and all of that? So then I looked into it and, you know, I I decided to do that for a year. Um, It was a great experience, um, you know, working with children and their parents. Um, And then I I left that and then I just happened to land in HR. My mother, um, she saw a civil service test in the paper uh, because she was a civil servant for the Board of Education for 25 years. Um, She asked me to take the test just to, I guess, ease her mind as to what I was going to do next. (laughs) So I took the test just to... Uh, accommodate her, just to be honest. Um, and then next thing you know, they called me for this, uh, like a, it was the city, you know, the city university of New York. They did like a job fair. They call in all of these folks. You do like a flash interview kind of situation. They picked me and they said, oh, we want you to come work in human resources with us. I wasn't working at the time. And so I just said, okay. And then it was all history after that. It was like a natural thing for me with the people and all of that. And then I just forged forward in that career for 22 years until the end of 2020. And were you journaling throughout that time? No, not exactly. I want to say that I stopped uh, when my mother passed about 13 years ago, I had stopped journaling at that point. Um, I didn't realize that I was doing it not to basically to avoid my feelings. And I didn't really realize it at the time. I didn't put it together. Mm. I just thought I, I, I just really wasn't, it wasn't in me. I, I wasn't pulled to write anymore for whatever reason. And it just kind of stopped. It was very sporadic here and there, but I never fully got into it again. And then I want to say it was, you know, maybe five years ago where I just started a little bit. And then when my boyfriend passed about two and a half years ago, that's when that journal then became the book that I published. So, And how about when you were a nanny? Did you write then? I did. I did. It, it, but it wasn't as much. You know, I, I, I think I want to say you know, you're in your twenties, you're starting to grow Mm. up a little bit more. I want to say I was, I had outside influences. Um, so I wasn't taking as much time. I want to say for myself and journaling as I was previously. And that's, that I think is just life, right? I think you start going, you know, you, you start relationships, friendships, whatever it may be, and you go in a different direction. And I think that's, that's where I think I pivoted and stopped focusing on myself a little bit. And that was uh, a, t- a change in my path. And by the way, when you journaled, there was always pen to paper. It was never, uh, it was at a computer. Yes. No. No. no, I need, yeah, I, for whatever reason, I need the pen in my hand. And still now to this day, I'm writing a little bit on a, um, it's like a notepad electronic mm. thing now, right? That it has the feel of a pen. I'm getting used to that. I'm not fully in the space yet, but I'm, I'm working on it. Um, but it's, it's a pen and paper. Cursive? For, me, for sure. Yep. Hmm. Very interesting. Yep. So you started just dwindling off as you, uh, you know, as you kind of got into your career, and then of course your mother passed, and you just mm-hmm. subconsciously. It's very interesting when I when I when I hear that because when you write, you're getting in touch with your feelings, and when you completely stop doing it, you didn't want to be. It makes perfect sense in hindsight, doesn't it? Yeah, in hindsight, absolutely. But in the time as I was going through it, I I wouldn't have thought to ask myself and said. Oh, Jennifer, you stopped journaling. It didn't. I was going through the motions of, okay, how do I build life now without my mother? It was, you know, she was a single mom who raised me. So she was my mom and my dad and my best friend. So you're talking this big chunk of my life now is gone. I was 33 years old. And yes, I was older, but it was still like, okay, I I built my life, my adult life around her. We lived two blocks Mm -hmm. apart, you know, all of that. So that's kind of difficult, right? You have someone like that leave. So I didn't want to address my feelings and I just was going in an automatic way like we do sometimes as humans. It was just, okay, I'm working. I'm concentrating on my career. I'm delving myself in work. And I really drowned myself in work and I didn't look Hmm. back. So if not for the tragedy of, of your boyfriend passing, would you have written Mark My Love? Yeah, I wouldn't have. And you wouldn't have returned back to journaling at all, you feel? I, yes, I get the goosebumps. You asked me that question. Yeah, I just got goosebumps. I probably wouldn't have. Um, but that the second loss hit me so hard, um, you know, and it, I was in shock. You know, I was in shock with my mother passed, but it was a different mm. kind of shock. It's hard to explain. And I was drawn to write. And I think that that was, I want to say, angels on the other side helping me. Like, you need to get back into your feelings and go through this because you blocked off a lot of your life. And now here you are again. And you know, so I think that's what drew me to start writing because I just, out of nowhere, I, I went to Barnes and Noble. I bought a new journal. 
And then one day by the pool in the afternoon, I just, after I was done with work, I went by the pool where I lived at the time, had a, had a, the pool out there and I just started writing and I was writing very rapidly. So it was faster than any time I had written in my life, meaning the pen was moving faster and I was writing very quickly. You know, perhaps uh, a parent dying is the kind of natural order of things. Uh, when, you know, when a, when, when a boyfriend or somebody of similar age dies, perhaps you just take it a little bit differently. I, I just throw that out there. I don't know if that's how it affected you. Now, when you say it was just pouring out, which, so when you're journaling at that point now, you've had tragedy strike and you're returning to the way you express your emotions, that's pen to paper. You're just writing in cursive. I mean, is it it's just it's just stream of thought? It's just thoughts that come to your head. Are you making? Are there full paragraphs? Are there bullets? Are there? What, what's the structure look like? Yeah, yeah, there were full paragraphs. There was exclamation points, bullets, all all kinds of things were coming out of me, um, and it was just flowing. It was flowing, and there really wasn't any thought in it. I'm just being honest. It just came. All the words came to me, but I really wasn't thinking about what I was writing. It was just flowing out of me, literally. And I knew I felt it, you know, I'm very spiritual. I knew there was, it was more than myself. I knew that there was others around me or whatever you want to call it. You know, people have different beliefs, but I knew it just wasn't me. I knew it wasn't the normal writing that I had did all those years of my life. And even though it had been a big block of time that I didn't write, I knew it was different. I felt it. It was different. There's all the theories of, you know, many artists have, you know, belief that, you know, they receive inspiration, be it a muse, be it spiritual, be it other, other ways. But, you know, I've heard, for example, and I, I tell this story often where Bob Dylan wrote, wrote a good song, a great song along the watchtower. Two weeks later, he sees Jimi Hendrix perform it and says, that was never my song. That's always been his, even though he wrote it. So, you know, it came through him, but it never was his. When you were receiving this inspiration to write like that, do you feel that at certain points it wasn't your own voice? I think it's a combination. I, I feel like it was my voice, but I also feel it was also messages from the other mm. side kind of coming through me. And I also knew that, you know, I call the book my baby because it's my first book and all of that, but I also knew I was meant to give it out to others. I knew that this wasn't just going to be a journal. And I also had to grapple with those feelings too, because I've been a very private person my whole life. Not a lot of people know mm. my business and sense and all of that. And I've kept it that way for different reasons. So then it was like, okay, now you're going to publish this journal that's raw. And so I had to grapple with that, which basically why that took me a whole year to grapple with those feelings. Was I going to do this? And then it was again, that feeling of you're meant to help other folks through your process of what you went through and they're supposed to read this. So then I knew, okay, it's not solely me. That yeah. And it was released around April uh, of 21. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I mean, so it's been out for a while now, nine, 10 months. And, you know, it leaves you a bit vulnerable, Jennifer. I mean, what has the feedback been from, from family, from friends, from the public when you, you know, put, you know, put your guts out in a book like this? Yeah, the feedback has been amazing, to be honest with you. Everyone has been very appreciative of how raw I was in my mm. emotions. Uh, they've all connected to it in different ways. Um, they realize that it's not just about um, loss. I go through a lot of things of I discuss, you know, self-esteem issues growing up and self-confidence issues that then dampened my, my path and so on. And I put it out there and I knew, okay, I meant to do this. And yes, it did put me in this vulnerable state, but I also knew... I'm supposed to help others that may have gone through these little things and they don't want to tell anyone because on the external, everyone in my life would have thought, oh, she has it all together. She's wearing the suit. She's this HR mm. professional. Everything looks perfect, but yet it wasn't. And that was kind of like me showing others. Yeah, you can look as if everything is perfect on the outside, but if, it, if it's not on the inside, all of that will come out eventually in different ways, whether you get illness or, you know, major depression and so on, or, you know, get into, you know, drinking or bad habits and so on. It's, you know, so it was kind of, I had to put myself out there, but the feedback has been amazing. I think people have said that they've related to it in different ways, whether it be people who they've lost and they're grieving and they're connecting that way, 
or the inspiration where I speak at towards the end of the book where I've turned everything around. My life is so different now. So then getting that inspiration of, oh, it can be done. Things can change. It doesn't have to be the same if you want it to be different. Yeah. What I appreciate really about you is that you've been through this. You have a way of expressing it. You express it, but it didn't, it didn't seem to me that the goal of your book was just to kind of say, Hey, this is the crap that happened to me. You say, I turn it around and this is how you can as well. You do that. Now you work with people who struggle with grief, who struggle with loss, who struggle with these things. And that takes a special kind of individual. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, I had to, you know, 2020 was a lot of soul searching mm -hmm. for me. You know, I, I knew I, I was meant to put this out, um, but I had to grapple with being vulnerable, like you said. And, um, but I knew I, I meant to help others and, and raise, you know, I don't want to say raise humanity up a little bit, but who knows? I, I don't know the depth of what I'm supposed to be doing here. We all, we all really don't know exactly. Right. And I do know that the last five years I had been asking the universe or whatever you want to call it, like what my purpose was. I knew that my career wasn't, I knew that I wasn't completely fulfilled the, all, all those two decades. Um, I just didn't know what it was. And I feel that this was this way they're telling me, oh, you're able to express your emotions that will then resonate with other people and maybe they can help themselves a little bit. You know, get, going back, very well said, by the way, but getting back to, you know, without the tragedy happen, this doesn't, you know, this book doesn't happen. Can, you know, I just think of so many things, you know, World War, World War II, terrible time, but the gains that we made in aviation, right? Because they needed it for military use, you know, thousands of, of, of pilots died, but we learned so much, you know, through this, I, I don't know why I picked that, but I just thought of it recently, but, you know, without tragedy, without taking a big step back, we can't move forward. You know, and so many people are afraid to fail. So many people are, you know, afraid of loss, but from it can really come great things. And it's a hard lesson to learn during it and right before it, but afterwards the, the, the benefits are there. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, for whatever strange reason, we're meant to experience pain in different ways here as human beings, but I think we're all supposed to get back to that road of how do we get back to love and unconditional love and, and self-love. I think we, we all lose that along the way a little bit because we take different titles in life, whether it becomes we get married and we have children and so on and so forth. We have other responsibilities. And I think that then we neglect where our own purpose and why we're here solely, right? Because now we have all of these subsets of our life. Um, but, you know, I think that it, it's all about love. I think it may sound strange, but the pain then can then lead to love. And, and new beginnings, right? And I use the different examples of my grieving because I stayed in the pain, right? After my mom passed for quite some time. I didn't realize I was doing it at the time, but I felt more comfortable there than moving on without her. I just didn't realize that I was doing it. Now this time around, it was kind of like they were teaching me a different way. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, you now lost this love of your life and this is, you're meant to do something with that. I realize now I'm going to turn the pain into fuel. And that's what I did and said, I'm going to change my life altogether. I'm, I'm so, I've always been grateful and thankful in my life, but now it's so much more. I'm thankful just for opening up my eyes every day. And I didn't say that to them before, but yet now I do every morning. I say, Hey, thank you for waking me up for another day. And then I take it from there. I wasn't that way before where now it's like this, my whole life is about gratitude and then spreading that love if I'm able to. Yeah. And we should be able to learn from that. You know, uh, 16, 17 years ago, my younger sister died in a, in an auto accident, you know, it was suddenly it was, it was a horrible thing, of course, but you know, from that point forward, you know, I never, my, with my parents, with my, now my kids, whenever we say bye, we say, I love you because it may be the last time. Uh, and, you know, from that, from that tragedy, we can learn so much, you know, I can remember the, the, one of the hard lessons I learned was, you know, at the, at the funeral, I was, uh, you know, I was about to speak and, you know, somebody comes up to me and says something about some rumor or something. And I say, how dare you approach me with my grieving parents there of, with this, you know, and it's a, you learn a lesson that, you know, you can't 
you can't make anybody think what you want them to think. You know, I have about three or four people in my life that I care about what to think, what they think everybody else. I can't control it. Let them, what they think is none of my business, you know? So, uh, like you said, just love is so much stronger. Love is just so much stronger. And that's the lesson we need to learn from all this. And those that don't have tragedy or perhaps not at this magnitude or perhaps even more, we learn from that lesson from others. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, um, you know, like you just said, it's these, these people, people come up to you with such silly questions when you're grieving and so on. And it's, it's uh, this last go around, I was just like, wow, I said, people don't realize when they're saying things, you know, my boyfriend, we had been uh, together about 10 months, you know, we, we met each other later in life. I'm, I'm, I'm in my 40s, he was in his early 50s. You know, he had been divorced previously, I had a long term relationship that ended. So at that point, you know, you don't know if you're going to mm. find someone again, you, you get a little like, okay, it's not going to happen. Then it happens. You, 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 you fall in love pretty quickly and you're like, wow, okay, this is, I think this is it. And then he's gone. So that was like a bigger lesson for me of, okay, wow, why did this happen? Like you brought this man into my life. He's the love of my life. And you took him away. But then I realized, okay, he's going to help me change my life. And that was for whatever reason it may be. But he, I know that God wanted him to experience love once again before he left the earth, whatever, you know, whatever contract we have when we're here and our time here, his contract was up and that sounds whatever, but I believe in that, right? We have our time and, and I know, but I know he's around me. Like, I know he's helping me. There's, there's signs all the time, every, you know, whether it be numbers or Mm. things and such on. And so I know that, I know that they're with me. So that's why everything is different for me. So even though it was a great tragedy, but I, I tell people, listen, I go, we had a great love, but also like that's, it was an intense period of my life because you're talking, you fall in love and then 10 months later mm-hmm. you're grieving. Right. And then for me, that was in 2019 that he, that he passed. I, I start writing the book a few months, you know, three months after he passes, I'm done with the book by 2019 at the end. Then I realize, okay, I meant to publish this. And then all of 2020 is me trying to grapple with, am I going to do this? But then also then COVID hits, right? in the pandemic. And it's kind of like, wow. Mm. <laughs> so it's, you know, it was, a, but I got through all of it. You know, I want to say that it may sound weird, but it was all meant to be. And I know that um, because last year it gave me that time and space that I was able mm. to grieve. I was able to work through a lot of emotions of my own. I was able to realize I meant to do something else. I, I knew that I would start, I was meant to forge a different path and that I was going to do it. And even though it meant doing something completely different than what I did my entire life professionally, I was ready for it. And I said, okay, we're going to do this. And, you know, it's, it's interesting with the universe because my intention was to end my career right before the book was published earlier this year, but life had different circumstances in front of me. And then my, you know, my job packaged me out at the end of December, 2020. And I know that it seemed everyone around me seemed to be like, what are you going to do? And, but no one knew I had this book in my back pocket because no one knew I had written it and what my intention was. I kept that all to myself because I do know that sometimes as humans, we don't mean to dampen each other's um, goals and dreams, but somehow, sometimes we do. We don't mean to do it intentionally, but it happens. So I knew this is going to be, I'm keeping this under wraps until I hit the cord and say, this is it. And then that's what I did. So it was, I know that, it was someone around me working this all out the way it happened. Um, and then, and then it was like, okay, 2021, I was like, let's go. You know, I, I built the website in January and, you know, and I, I just turned, I turned my whole life around and said, okay, now I'm in this creative space. Let's see what it brings. And here I am doing a bunch of podcasts and so on. And it feels exactly right. So from the time <laughs> he passes to you start journaling right away with the, with the notion that you're creating a book. No, he passed in, in April of 2019. I started in July, towards the end of July of 2019, See. I started journaling. And no, it wasn't my notion of a book. I was just journaling. I was just literally writing out, but I knew it, the way it was flooding out of me. I knew, okay, this is something different. Uh. And then, and then it came, then it was kind of, then they were giving me, I, it's hard to describe, but messages of, you know, you're meant to publish this. When you say they, and when you said they when were I, giving you, who? The, the universe, my angels, everyone on the other side, I, I, it's, it's hard to describe. And I know that everybody, everyone will have a different, you know, thought on spirituality and what they feel and it, and it'll be different for everyone. 
but you, you get sort of certain feelings and you know, then you, you just know it's hard to describe. And I just knew that they were telling me, no, you're meant specifically, specifically my mother, I want to say where she was, she literally, I had seen an intuitive and she had a message to write away from my mother. And she had said, your mother's telling me to tell you it's time to show yourself to the world. And I literally had no idea what mm. she was talking about. I was like, I, I don't know. I don't know what she's talking about, but you know, with intuitives, it's, it's, you know, they, they go by what they mm. feel. They're not going to give you the exact, you know, I don't think there's an exact, okay, tell her to do this. It, I don't think it works that way. So it was just that message of it's time to show yourself to the world. And I was kind of like, I, then I had to think about that and say, I, I don't know what this is. And then I realized it clicked and I said, oh, it's the journal. I meant to publish it. So then I, I felt compelled to go. I decided to go take a memoir class just to get that feel of that writing space because I don't know it from anything to be around other writers. And that helped me. I realized, you know, okay, I got the lingo going with a lot of different writers and I realized that world. And I, at that point I did add to the book a little bit. I added some dialogue because I felt that it needed it based on what they were telling me, but I also didn't um, change the format of the book in any which way um, because I did give snippets of it in class for readings because we had a project, Mm. obviously. Um, I, so I pulled out snippets of it. I didn't tell them I had fully written it already. I pulled out snippets. It got a lot of great reviews, a lot of thought. Um, but that's where they had mentioned where maybe they would need some dialogue. They wanted, you know, they were like, oh, dialogue between your mother and you and dialogue between, you know, you and your boyfriend. So that's where then I just added creatively, I'd added some dialogue in of conversations I remember that we had um, between both of them. But um, even in that class, I remember um, there was one critique where someone told me, if you're going to publish this, you're probably not going to be able to keep an audience because of the 13 year time gap between the losses. And I, I literally, I got chills again. I knew it, it doesn't matter. It, it wasn't about a timeline. I knew, no, I'll get the audience because it wasn't about timing. It was about the difference in the grieving that I had, but then also everything in between that I mentioned, all these little snippets of, you know, being a young girl and different things that went on and my life, a little bit of everything to help others. So I knew that I would, I had no issue with keeping an audience and everyone who's told me it's a short memoir. So it's about 84 pages, but it's, it's intense. It's an intense 84 pages. Everyone tells me, um, but I've had people tell me they read it in one day, they couldn't put it down. They got it, started reading and they read, read it through in in one sitting. So I, I, I knew in my own feeling again, that that wasn't uh, that critique. I just kind of shrugged it off. And why a memoir? Why not fiction? Why not remove yourself from it kind of uh, percep- you know, perspectively? I, f- I felt that me- people needed to see someone real, right? They need- I felt that they needed to see someone real. And then being a Latin woman, mm-hmm. we're not always encouraged to speak about our mm-hmm. feelings. So I felt that I-, I was getting urged that it needed to be real from that perspective. Yeah, that's very interesting because... Um... Yeah, I guess I guess that 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 really is true. I I didn't realize the Latin perspective there. You're not, you're you're exp- you're not encouraged to speak about yourself. I didn't know, but I didn't know this. It's it's kind of like you know, and, and that depends, right? Obviously, I, I come I'm Puerto Rican, Mexican, and Cuban. You know, other other Spanish backgrounds could be different, but I want to say when it comes to emotions, it, it was always very like telling me to sh- like strengthen up and you know that was a sign of strength that kind of just don't don't get into your emotions and your feelings and speak about that so like I said I, I can't speak for the entire Latin community right I don't want to put that blanket on it you're however first. I know that it yeah 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 so. that's very interesting and how does you becoming a yogi for 12 years when does that when does that uh, introduce itself yeah, so that was about a year uh, after my mom passed. I was just walking around in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, and uh, there was a this little shop that had just little trinkets and things. I walk in there. They also did like yoga classes, and I just felt drawn to it. And I was like, all right. I, I had no one in my life who had done yoga. And then I just took a class, and then I felt peace. I felt peace in the class, whatever it was. So then I just kept going with it. And then it, it was helping my body. It was, and it helped in my healing mm. process too. I just think I didn't delve in deep enough. Obviously, like I said, I think I was in this, almost like in this middle zone of grief, uh, you know, it's hard to describe, but I was in a middle zone. I didn't kind of, you know, and, but the yoga, it's every day I do yoga for a little bit of, and it helps my body so much, but it helps me mentally, emotionally, 
and it, it keeps me centered. And do you have any regrets from the memoir? Would you change anything? No, no. I think um, everything was in there that I needed to say. I, you know, I think at some point uh, that had a few readers that would ask me that knew me would say, oh, you, you should have wrote a little bit more about this mm. or that. But it, it, I was like, no, I, I didn't. It was stuff I didn't feel was necessary. I, I went into what I, I dabbled in a little bit of different relationships in my life and so on. And I, I gave just enough. It was, I felt as if my mother always used to give me this uh, advice that she would say that if you, if you had a really good hamburger and it was really cooked well, you didn't need all of these extra condiments that people put on there where they, you know, <laughs> and it was almost like that. So almost like keep it simple, right? <laughs> the same kind of thing. And always that she's always in my mind with that. So it was unnecessary things. They were asking me that how come I didn't go into depth and in this or that. It, it was unnecessary things. So. And any 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 uh, bad backlash from family members or friends? I didn't know this happened. Why didn't you tell me? Or anything? Any negativity like that? Actually, it's not necessarily negativity. Just perhaps elaboration. Uh, I want to say it was just. I think family. I think they I, they had a little bit of a laugh because I my I could be a little bit of a not comedian but a little comic of how I describe things. So I think that they it gave them a, a chuckle. Um, it also brought them back a little bit of their own childhood back in Brooklyn because I described the neighborhood a little bit. So it was almost like nostalgic for them where they were like, they were thanking me for taking them back in time a little bit, I want to say with those memories, but it wasn't like backlash. It was more of, you know, and it was family and friends and even some folks I work with just asking me, could they had done more? Like, did they help me enough? And some of them mm. apologized too, that so that they didn't realize that. I was struggling so much and then I had a lot on my plate. Um, so, yeah. so how much have you been journaling since release since April? Oh, see, the funny thing is I'm not, I'm not journaling in that way, but I have been writing two additional books simultaneously because things are coming to me, but it's not in a journaling sense. If that makes sense, it's kind of one is about spirituality. So it's kind of what I've been discovering this whole time and that I'm realizing a lot of different things. So it's kind of almost documenting that it's kind of, you know, and obviously that'll be a nonfiction book, but it's also going through my journey, but it's not, it's not spoken in a word of like, Oh, this happened today mm -hmm. and blah, blah, blah. It's just in a different way. It's just talking about my experiences. And then the other one is kind of a combination of that'll probably be end up being a fiction book, but it's based on real life events. So that's almost like you said earlier, how come I didn't step away and make it a mm -hmm. character? Whereas this secondary book that's there, that's coming out of me, that will be stepping away from it based on some real life, real life events. So what is the um, condition of the publishing industry in your, in your mind after releasing a book? Is it in good shape? Is it in a good place? Well, I think, I think everyone has a story to tell. I think that, you know, a lot of folks are writing memoirs these days. And I know that before I published the memoir, cause I self published mm. it, but I do know that someone had mentioned to me, oh, the memoir space is so saturated right mm. now. But I feel I avoided that that advice too, because I realized, actually, she told me to keep going though, actually. She had given me that advice, but she had said, keep going. Because, and then I realized in my own experience, we all have a different story. No one will have the exact same story. So I encourage everyone to, to write their stuff. And it, it doesn't really matter what the publishing industry is and how it is right now, to be honest with you. I decided to self-publish. I did go the route of giving it to an agent just to see, but that was only for the experience. I, I knew in my gut that I would mm. self-publish. I knew that I wanted to have it the way I wanted it. I didn't want anyone to break apart the book in any which way. I knew I wanted it to leave it in that state, but I also wanted to get the experience of the agent process just to know. And what was that experience so. like with an agent? I, it was interesting. I mean, they took a while to read my material and then, you know, the rejection, it wasn't bad. It was just... Um, you know, they, they were in a different direction. You know, I think that sir, I, I didn't realize that certain agents, they pick up certain, whether it be a certain number of nonfiction, fiction, and so on, whatever mm -hmm. they're working on, they already set kind of goals of, okay, I already picked up this many nonfiction this year and all of that. So when I came in with mine, they had, were already on their adventures of nonfiction space, but it wasn't anything of negative, like this isn't going to sell. Do you think for your next? And I didn't Sorry. feel... Yeah. You know, and I didn't feel rejected by it. It was kind of like, okay, that's cool. There wasn't any like, oh, 
great. This isn't going to work. It was like, okay, I needed to get that experience to see that world. And then I was like, I was going to keep going anyway, because I was already doing that. Will you self-publish again? It depends. It depends. I want to see. I want to see what comes into my space. Um, I, I've been getting different messages in a sense, again, from my, I, I call my peeps on the other side. <laughs> so I have to see what they're flowing into my space, to be honest with you. I, I meditate every mm. single day. That gives me a, a tremendous guidance in what I need to do. So I'm kind of just going with the flow right now. I, I, I won't answer that question, yes or no, because I have to I see. don't know yet. Yeah. Do you consider yourself a disciplined person? Oh, yes. Absolutely. So? Oh gosh, I, I if I set a goal of what I need to do, I, I, I stick to it. I stay I, I almost get like this laser focus and I kinda look at that goal and I keep on for it. So that takes mm. discipline because anything can sidetrack us in life, right? You have a, a glimmery a glimmery light will come next to you and someone's like, Oh, look at that shiny ball and then you're staring at that instead of your goal. So I wanna say that that's always been my my way of being laser focused and you know, as a yogi, that's part of it, right? Meditating every day and doing what I do that I know that keeps me censored. So I need that discipline to do that. Yeah, it does. Uh, it tends to remove distractions when you're, yeah, when you're disciplined like that and just journaling itself. Do you journal every day now? Not every day. I, it's more like, it's kind of like these short snippets of notes to myself, to be honest. I don't, I don't, you know, before it used to be very like, cathartic in a sense where I'd, I'd need a space, right? I'd have a space, special place to write all. Now it's very kind of things can come to me out when I'm mm -hmm. walking and so on. So it's almost like these little snippets at times where I just jot a few notes down I, like, that way. That's kind of all I, I need right now. I think before I needed to go in deeper, I think all of my life. And that's why that was going on right now. It's kind of been a little short and sweet, and it's kind of been that's been working for me. It's interesting. You're disciplined in that you're opening yourself up to inspiration. It seems to me, whereas mm -hmm. some people are just kind of close oh. to that, and they just get set in the the, the daily grind. And it, a lot of people I talk to meditate. By the way, I jump subjects to meditation. Do you do it assisted or unassisted? Uh, I do both. It depends. Uh, I always do unassisted every day, a little bit of snippet on, on my own. But at times I feel guided that I need a little something more. And then that's where the guided comes into play. And then I also just recently joined a group where it's a little bit of a group meditation. So that's a newer thing mm. for me, um, which has been interesting because a lot of information has been coming through to me um, during those sessions. So it, it's been a, a, new, a, a, new, a new enlightening thing for me. So your advice... Well, let me ask this first. Do you you kind of alluded to it at one point? Does everybody have a book in them? Oh yes, everybody has a story, so everyone has a book in them. I think it's just, you know, narrowing it down, right? I want to say that so many folks that I've met along the road here, it's like so many things that happen in life, and they're going in every different angle. And and I did mention that I go through a lot of little snippets in my life in it, but I don't dive in as deep in it. I kind of just. I describe it as like, um, I'm almost like skipping on stones. So I'm skipping across the river on stones. I kind of dabble in and tell a little bit of snippets of my life. Um, but I think that folks that I met, they, they want to concentrate so much on a certain thing and then it becomes this big and then they're going in every which angle. So does that make sense mm. like that? And then what advice do you give? Yes, it does. I'm sorry. My, my hmm is an affirmative <laughs> affirmation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and what advice would you give to those who may feel or may feel they kind of have a story in them? Go for it. Write sure. it down. I mean, I've met so many people along the Yeah. So many folks along the way, like, oh, I've, I've always wanted to write, you know, people that read the book and I just tell them, so then just write like, you know, don't, and you don't even have to set it in your mind. Like I'm going to write a book. It's, it's so intense of, of putting that on, on yourself. Right. My journey didn't start that way. I just started writing. And then I realized, oh, it formed into a total book on its own. So it's like, I just tell people, just write it down. If you feel compelled to do that, it's just like anything else, right? If you're drawn to music and you want to learn, you know, the piano or something like that, go for it. If you feel that's in your soul, do it. You know, like why, why stop yourself? Yeah. Like Faulkner said, don't be a writer, just be writing. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah I, I, yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I liked, uh, I've always liked dance as a, as, since I was yeah. a little girl and but, you know, my mother couldn't afford to send me to dance classes. So, hey, I, I'd watch TV, see, see people dancing, and then boom, I, I'd mimic them dancing. And, hey, 
I'm a great dancer. So, you know, that's, that's, it is what it is. You know, if there's something in you, there's something there, right? If you feel that way, then go for it. You know, Hmm. Jennifer, how do you measure success? Oh gosh, I think it's how, how you can love your fellow human beings unconditionally at this point, very different from what I measured before. I think I was uh, being in the corporate space. It was all about Mm. titles and rankings and so on. And I got into that world and then, you know, it took me, it didn't, I was still in the world and, but I still real, I realized, I started realizing, oh, this isn't success. I realized there's so many unhappy people around me. I started waking up to that and realizing, wow, left and right, everyone is unhappy, but yet they're making a lot of money, but everyone seems discontent with their life. So then the measure of success then changed for me. And now I know it's me being able to, you know, love another human being unconditionally and, and not, you know, put my nonsense on them and all mm. of that and try to impact people more positively. Well said and, and very uh, inspirational. I always, uh, people ask me and I say, well, I'm a father of my daughters and son of immigrants. You know, I uh, start from there. Uh, last kind of playful question, Fleetwood Mac, favorite band. Ah, yes. Don't always. stop. <laughs> yep. Don't stop. I, it's, you know, that's uh, my, one of my, my godmother, she introduced me. Uh, she's, she's also my older cousin. Um, she introduced me to Fleabag Mac way back when, cause that was, that was her, her time. I want to say, right. I was, I was younger, mm-hmm. but listening to it and watching the joy in her. And then I was just drawn to it and I, I love the music and that's when that started. So I've been, I've been a fan since I was a kid. Jennifer, I can't, uh, uh, I can't thank you enough for your time. I really enjoyed this. Uh, Jennifer Alimani, I please tell us how we can get in touch with you. Tell us your website. Tell us uh, how you're, you've got great Instagram. I like your posts. Um, I, I, I like all your social media. Please tell us how to find you. Yeah, uh, my website is uh, jennifermalamani.com. Um, my Instagram is also gen, jennifer.m.alamani. Um, and then my book is on Book Baby and uh, on, on Amazon also. And Alemany is spelled A L E M A N Y. Yes. So it's www.jenniferm.alemany, A L E M A N Y.com. And we'll put it in the show notes for sure. Jennifer, thank you so much for your time. You be well. Uh, and uh, I look forward to maybe eventually meeting face to face and having a cup of coffee there in the great, great borough of Manhattan. Yes. Thank you so much. I really enjoy this conversation and thank you for the opportunity. You be well. Bye now. Thank you for listening and or viewing Joey Pinn's Discipline Conversations. Please share this episode with one or two of your friends who you think may benefit from the episode. Our website, www.joeypins.com. There you find lots of resources and you could join our mailing list. Please follow us on all our social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook podcast information the video version of our podcast is on youtube please subscribe audio is on all major podcasting platforms please follow them and if you like it please consider giving five star rating would really appreciate that would you like to financially support the podcast you can go to our patreon site consider five ten or twenty dollars a month there's all kind of plans that we have there It's like a one-time payment. What is this podcast episode worth to you? $25, $50, $100, $500, $1,000, $5,000. You be the judge. You can go to our PayPal account to do that as well. Thank you again for listening or watching Joey Pinn's Discipline Conversations.